You're now live. I am live. Action. Hello, everyone. Well, welcome to a slightly rainy Crystal Palace Park. And for those of you who followed my last video on Travel Curious, um, this is part two. For those of you who haven't seen this video, please go to YouTube and you will see that video, which is all about the first part of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Now, I shouldn't be rude because I need to introduce myself and my lovely assistant here. We are from the same household, which means we are following our normal daily cycle or walk to Crystal Palace Park. We're getting some exercise. My name's Dr. Aaron Hunter. I'm a proud Blue Badge Guide of London. And my lovely camera assistant is Rob today. Now, Rob, can you see people coming on there with likes and things? Yeah, all two of them. All two of them. It's a good start. And we hope to get more. But of course, those of, those of you who want to see this, we're going to put it on YouTube after, afterwards. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be showing you uh, around Crystal Palace, but the other half of the story. And that story is all about the end of the dinosaurs and the beginning of mammals. What, what, so we're going to ask simple questions. What's a reptile? What's a mammal? Well, a reptile is an animal that can lay, a le lay an egg. And a dinosaur is an animal um, which is a type of reptile. So reptiles, we have snakes, we have um, turtles. Now a branch of reptiles, a long time ago in the Permian, so over 200 million years ago, they branched off and they became the ancestors of the mammals. While another branch of the reptiles branched off and they became the dinosaurs. So I'm beginning this sort of broadcast today with actually showing you the dinosaurs themselves. These are the models of what we thought dinosaurs looked like during the 1850s. These models were designed by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. Um, they were completed around 1852 and 1853. And the last broadcast I did, I explained that the one with the horn on so, Rob, that's the one on top there with the horn on top. That one there is, is Iguanodon. And it is from the Cretaceous age. So it's the early, early Cretaceous. And that means around about 100 to around 90 million years ago. Now, dinosaurs are classified by their hips. And they're unusual because unlike reptiles, and I'm actually going to do an impression here, I think it's something to ad lib, a reptile will walk literally like this. They have a gait like that, okay? But a dinosaur, it feels like I'm doing yoga here, the dinosaur walks with an upright gait, and that's what makes them unique. So although these dinosaurs are inaccurate today, um, they actually are accurate in the fact they have an upright gait rather like a mammal because mammals eventually independently evolved that as well. So what happened to the dinosaurs? The dinosaurs were the dominant animal on the earth, on the land, for a very, very long time. We're talking around 200 million to about 65 million years ago. And then they became extinct. During that time, our ancestors, the mammals, were the size of your finger or your thumb. They were tiny and they were lived in small burrows. They were certainly not in charge of the earth. The dinosaurs, in fact, the dinosaurs hadn't become extinct. Maybe today these wouldn't be model dinosaurs. These would be actual dinosaurs and it would make social distancing far more difficult. But what we're going to do now is we're going to walk towards the other part of the park and it's there we're going to be looking at our mammal story. So if Rob hands me the phone because what I want to do is to show you a, a slideshow because it's a bit of a walk and what we want, if you can see me okay here, please excuse me I'm quite new to this. So there was the advert that I was talking about here. And I'm going to walk here with Rob. We're going to walk our way towards um, looking at the next lot of the dinosaurs. I'm going to start off, you can see on my screen here, with the first thing I'm going to talk about, um, which is the Mosasaurus. Now, this is not a dinosaur, even though it has the word saurus at the end. It's actually a 
reptile and it's closely related to the snakes. And so, but in fact, it's one really scary snake. Now, those of you who may know the movies Jurassic World, that's the big one in the sea, which eats the dinosaur at the end. Okay, so if you want to watch that movie, which is not necessarily scientifically accurate, but does have a scientific advisor, I do know him, um, it is very much that big marine animal. But they were pretty scary and big, Mosasaurs. So, Mosasaurs would have been one of the last predators during the time um, of the Cretaceous and um, they would have existed in an area today that is Belgium and Holland. In fact, it's Maastricht. It's called a Mosasaur because it's from the area of the Mosa River. And the Mosasaur was discovered and worked at by the French paleontologist Georges Cuvier. So Georges Cuvier was really a very important man who was involved in the foundations of paleontology. And what he did was a science we call comparative anatomy. He looked at present day animals and then he then looked at fossils and tried to compare them. Except the Mosasaur was a real riddle because it was so different from everything else they had seen. The idea of a giant snake-like thing in the sea, quite large, was really quite scary. Now we're going to take a small stop now because we're going to show you that Crystal Palace actually has its very own Mosasaur. And it's a big challenge for here, Rob, because you're going to have to do a pretty big zooming in over there to see that. His little face. His little face, but we're going to show that to you. So I'm going to hand back to Rob. There you go. Make sure that our, our cameras are nice and clean because it is rainy, but it is a, a great day to be out here in Crystal Palace. We like our exercise. And Rob's gonna, gonna, now going to zoom in over here on our Mosasaurus. So imagine a snake that's the size of a small car. It has an enormous mouth that would probably fit you in it. And teeth which are quite huge in the way they look. Um, and in fact, the teeth are probably again the size of your thumb or if you've got a big hand, yeah, I think you mean twice the size of a thumb. So they're pretty large things. Um, so, what we're going to do now, and I think we've have we re engaged, I think you can see that. I think people are waving, I quite like that. Yes, I wave back. You wave back, yes. We're now going to, so those of you who can see that, because we've got double screens here, so you can see the actual fossil, which I really like, the collection. These images are open access, by the way, so there's no copyright on these. Uh, so you can share this, this particular content if you want to. Uh, now I'm going to do is I'm going to continue our stroll. Uh, this is my exercise stroll. Rob, we're going to have the, the camera back. He is a great cameraman, but, and I'm not so good, but um, it's good to sort of show you. Now we're going to talk about the next deposit, the next story, is Messel. And here is Messel. Now Messel, here it is, um, is an oil shale. And an oil shale from central Germany, around the area of Frankfurt. So uh, Frankfurt, Frankfurt area, Hess, uh, an area sort of Hessen central part of Germany, has a fantastic World Heritage Site called Messel. And Messel is, has this oil shale which has these very fine bones. We have now moved after the period of the mass extinction. 65 million years ago the dinosaurs became uh, extinct and they um, they, the theories really sort of, they varied. We used to have loads of theories for what, how these animals could have become extinct. Um, some of them were quite crazy in the past. Uh, during the 1980s, there were people who suggested that the dinosaurs died of hay fever, and I'm not joking. Uh, they thought that flowers evolved and they all died sneezing. Um, but later, and then we had an idea they died because the, the fact they were all cold-blooded, uh, which is not true. Most of them are not cold-blooded. They're actually warm-blooded. But eventually we discovered the smoking gun and that was a meteorite um, crater. But it, of course it was hidden. We found it using geophysical methods. Um, and when we found that, we realized that a comet, not even a meteorite, a comet had gone into the earth. And that was the one that had, had affected the dinosaurs. So um, the dinosaurs became uh, extinct. There was also a lot of volcanic activity that contributed to this. And so we have a new world, and the new world is the world of the mammals. 
Now, mesome is a very important deposit because when you go into this oil shale, these very soft bits of siltstone, these uh, siltstone, they, they, are, they will fall apart in your hands. So it's a very special way of preparing the fossils. What we do is we turn the fossil over, we attach a piece of resin or plastic to it, and then we um, pretty much get rid of all of the oil shale material. So we, we pick it all away and we leave the bones in resin. And you can see one here. This is a very unusual looking animal. This is kind of like a squirrel. And Messel has these. In fact, for now, I'm going to be, if I hand this to Rob temporarily, because mm -hmm. I need to check the wonderful timing. Oh, we're, we're, we're halfway through, we're good. So um, let's show you our first stop so I can show over here. This is the mammals section. Look at the colour. Everything else before now has been green because it's Cretaceous. It's before 65 million years ago. But, um, and in fact, if Rob, actually, if we go in the corner, you can just see, we can have another little look at our Mosasaur with greater detail this time, so less um, wobbliness. And we can film that and show it to you. So there's our Mosasaur. Let's say a little bit more about our Mosasaur before we go back to the mammals. So let's go before 65 million years ago. And that Mosasaur is actually quite accurate, that model. The head was that size, the eye was that size. Interesting enough though, we didn't know very much about it because we didn't have uh, very much data on the back of the animal. And so Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins decided to, um, to, to fudge it by putting the animal coming out of the water. So he had no idea of the tail, but we can't see the tail, so we don't mind. We, can, we don't even really can see the, the flipper very well either. So it works because you can't see it. Also another reminder, you'll see um, some more hens there and some coots, the modern day dinosaurs, because of course that's what dinosaurs became were the birds. Now Rob, we're going to move along a bit here and we're going to look at these very unusual looking mammals. And this is our first mammal. I'm going to carry on with Messel. I think it's best to sort of for us to uh, take a pause um, when we look at this particular mammal. But this, this animal is a kind of horse-like animal. And um, in fact, it's meant to look like a horse, but in reality, it's not a horse. In fact, it's, um, it's more like uh, a camel, in fact. Now, when they did the reconstructions for these particular animals, they thought of them as being something like a horse, something like something that would have been perhaps browsing. And the reason they knew that was because there were other fossils being discovered that were similar, fossils that we found in Messel as well. So this animal, although it looks at the reconstructions in the 1850s to look a little bit like, like a kind of a horse, in reality, they're closer to what we call artiodactyls. And artiodactyls are the same thing as camels. They're the same thing as hippotamuses and things like that. And actually, eventually and strangely, even whales come from them. Now, let's go back again and have our, at, again, at our part. We're going to now switch round and I'm going to show you more of my slideshow of a lovely Messel. Here it is. So, here we have some of our slideshow. So where am I? I need to switch myself round. Where am I? Yeah, so the screen's getting a bit wet, but it's fine. It's actually quite dry. Here I am again with the hat. And so here we have here, we've got our uh, our squirrels. But what else do we have in Messel? Well, we have as well, um, we have these unusual squirrel-like animals as well in Messel. And we have uh, other things. So imagine 40 million years ago when Messel existed, that we had really an entire collection of different animal types, different mammals, and mammals were kind of getting going. So all the mammals we have today existed there but they were all really small. They were tiny. And so most of these are the size of a domestic cat. And they included squirrels. They included things like, uh, in this case, this one here is a, a kind of porcupine, perhaps even a hedgehog. 
They also had things that look very similar to this one here, which is like a little kangaroo-like object. We've got that too. Um, and not only that, but we had things that are the size of a dog, but are the ancestors of the hippotamus. We had one of those as well. Um, so you can see Messel is such an amazing deposit because it preserves many of these animals. But it includes things that we know today. In particular, the first bats are also found in Messel. And here they are here, an, an original kind of bat-like animal. Um, the most interesting discoveries that have ever been found in Messel are things that we didn't even think were there and they were found later on. And they include some of the earliest horses. This is an early horse. It's the size of a small dog. Um, I just need to sort of clear my camera here. And um, this dog-like thing um, is in fact, thanks Rob, I'm going to clean up our cameras. Um, this dog has four toes. Now modern horses literally run on one toe. So they are rather strange in that respect. Uh, in fact, so the evolution of horses is a very unusual story. Started the size of a small pig or a large dog. Uh, with four toes. I mean, this one's called Popeliocatherium. I've been trying careful here with not too many scientific names today because I could go on for a while. Um, but a few are coming up in a minute. Um, and we also have other examples like Mesohippus. And they, they are things that were horses that gradually reduced their toes until we have the modern equus. Now, here we are here, we're going, now Rob's going to be filming some of these plaques here. It's going to show some of the reconstructions of the, the, the fossils in Messel. I'm going to finish off this, though, by showing you um, one of the greatest discoveries in Messel. It was featured on a BBC documentary. This here um, is uh, a lemur. And uh, today they only inhabit Madagascar. But lemurs used to be global. We used to have lemurs in Germany. Um, and in this case, this lemur was high significant because lemurs are the most primitive primates. So lemurs will then lead to monkeys, monkeys then lead to primates, and of course then we are classified as primates. Right, okay, time to do some more filming there, Rob. You're going to look at that. So here we have here is some of the displays that we have on the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. So we have just been looking at Anoplotherium. This is the animal here which as you can see how our knowledge has changed. I'll be showing another reconstruction in a moment, but you can see the 1854 knowledge here of how we thought it looked, rather dog-like. And now we can see perhaps similar, because we have most of the bones on these, these particular animals. These were found in Britain, by the way, and they were worked on by that, that anatomist I mentioned earlier, Georges Cuvier. Now we're going to do a loop back again in a minute, because I'm going to show you in the deep of the forest, I'm going to show you Paleocatherium. Now, Paleotherium is another example of an animal that we thought we thought it looked like. In fact, its name means ancient beast. We reconstructed it like a tapir because we thought it looked like a tapir. But in fact, now it looks closer to something again that we can't really place. It reminds us in paleontology it's very difficult because many of these animals, uh, we really um, don't know what they look like, especially at the time. Now, one fossil I can't show you today, one model I can't show you today, is Megalotherium, because it really does hide in, in the, the undergrowth. So this is what I can show you today. Very important animal, because it's one of the ones that was found by Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin, when he finished his studies in Cambridge, he had the ultimate field trip. He went down to South America, onto the Falkland Islands, the Galapagos, and then onto Australia. And one of the things that he saw on the beaches of Argentina was the giant sloth or megalotherium. And for those of you who are from the guiding community, if you go to the Naturista Museum, that's the one in the mammal, in the reptile gallery, near the door into the, into the sort of paleontology department and next to the bird gallery. And I'll be showing that picture in a second. Okay, let's walk again. So now we're gonna go up and have a look. So as I do that, I'm gonna show you some more reconstructions of these animals. So I hope it, this bit is a, it is a bit of an experiment, but here they are. So here's our unusual camel-like animal, Pelicotherium. And here's another reconstruction. Again, these, this, this reconstruction here is the one we know, we think it looks like. A kind of, we call arboreal, meaning it lives, likes to sort of go up against the trees. Um, and it would have been able to stand on two legs. Not all the time, but 
it would have been very happy to do that when it was uh, when it's sort of going to its um, feeding. Scavenging is the word I was looking for. Now this is our tapir-like animals. So this is what they look like in the reconstructions. And now again, I'm handing back to my lovely assistant because he's going to then show you um, the, the actual animals themselves here in Crystal Palace Park. So if you are here in South London, it is free to come here. Uh, and it's one of the, strangely, one of the few things that's open right now. You can come here for your exercise if you are local to Bromley. Uh, I do advise you, of course, to be careful. Uh, it is quite a, a walk or a cycle from my house to get here, um, about 15 minutes by cycle. But, um, you know, if you are in the local area and you can put this into your exercise regime, please be safe. And it's good to come and, and, and look at these. But as you can see, the snout here looks extremely tapir-like um, and is, is utterly wrong. But it was a fantastic uh, reconstruction they did at the time. Remember, this was in the 1850s and it was the first time that these mammal-like animals were actually collected. Now I'm going to go back to my slideshow here and I'm going to show you here uh, the example of the mega Megatherium as we walk towards our last stop. I hope you've enjoyed this tour. It's only 30 minutes but I do like to make them short and sweet and I will be putting it on YouTube for those of you who'd like to uh, see more of this. So this is the example of Megatherium from the Natural History Museum London. The Ma Natural History Museum London in the 1980s used to have a whole gallery of mammals, fossil mammals, but later on that was actually removed. It's quite sad. And this is the last remaining specimen from that gallery uh, that the museum kept on display because it's so spectacular and because it's links to Charles Darwin and the, the theory uh, of natural selection, which explains uh, that concept that we call evolution. And to give you a reconstruction of it, here it is there. You can see a reconstruction of the animal, the giant sloth that would have existed. In fact, South America had its very own special fauna, as we call it, collection of animals. And um, we have this concept that we call the Great North American Interchange, when very well-adapted animals from, from North America literally went over the land bridge in Panama and wiped out all of the mammals that we had uh, in South America. And South America has a very unique fauna, uh, which includes many of these larger mammals, but even uh, most of those mammals that we know today in South America are really North American mammals. It did go the other way, by the way. Marsupials, animals with pouches that we know very much from, from Australia, they used to be global. In fact, we think they probably evolved in the area around China. They moved around the world, uh, eventually becoming isolated in Australia, but you still find marsupials in South America and one of them, the possum, got into North America and you find that as far north as Virginia. So we're now coming to the end of our tour today and I think we're going to finish on one of the most spectacular animals and we've gone a long way because we have moved uh, through the whole of 40 million years, 30 million years, but now we're less than 1 million years we're now going to look at the Ice Age. And I'm going to hand back to Rob here. I'm going to show you this picture because this is... This here, excuse me, uh, this here is the giant Megalodon, the giant um, Megaloceros, the huge, huge, huge Irish elk. Now, excuse the joke, Irish elk, well, it's not strictly Irish, although they are found in Ireland, and it's not really an elk, but it's a good name. Um, the reason why it's called the Irish elk um, is because they were famous in Ireland. In Ireland, you go into peat bogs and you find these huge antlers. Now, look at those antlers up there. They are 40 kilograms in total. Now, you'd think that's amazing. It's even more amazing when you realise that they would grow an entire set of those per season for the rutting season because these are deer they use their antlers uh, for mating for gaining advantage uh, to gain a mate and to do that they had to grow these huge antlers so can you imagine walking around with those on your head for the season um, in terms of their heritage, I often like to talk about Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. It's the only historic royal palaces site outside of the London area. And if you go in through the entrance of Hillsborough Castle, which is the official royal residence of Her Majesty the Queen and the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland uh, in 
Ireland or in Northern Ireland, um, you will see a set of these antlers above the door. And the, the, the guide there will tell you it is a traditional Irish welcome because they're giving you a huge display above the door because people in Ireland were taking these out of the peat box. But how did they get here? Well, they got there because of the Ice Age. These were Ice Age animals. So when the Ice Age came and where we were in Britain today stopped becoming subtropical. So in Trafalgar Square, it is true that we had things like rhinoceroses and hippopotamuses and all sorts of strange large animals at that time. Um, but when the Ice Age arrived, much larger animals evolved and they were quite woolly. Woolly rhinos and very large deer. The animals became very large to deal with this issue. And a type of human also became quite large, Neanderthals. And they're very much an Ice Age being as well. But when the Ice Age ended, these animals suddenly found themselves too, too big, too clunky and much smaller animals evolved to take over their niche and they became extinct. But they are really recent in terms of paleontology, in terms of the history. So I think I'm bang on time um, and I think it's good if you ask me lots of questions. I will happily answer them if you have a quick question to stick in right now. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, show you here a bit more of this lovely scene. This is the end of the Crystal Palace story because beyond this is the cafe and the end of the park. It's almost like the cafe, uh, it's almost like the, the whole park is here to take you through history. You can go from either end. You can go from the earliest animals uh, towards one side of the park over to the cafe where you have the youngest animals, these particular uh, giant Irish elks. It's been a great pleasure today to introduce you to all of these animals um, and I do hope to do more of these particular uh, broadcasts when museums are open because what I like to do is introduce you really to paleontology, the science. It is a science I do every day. I'm a professional. I do study these animals and publish papers on them. But it's a great pleasure to introduce you to animals that you've never, maybe never thought existed. And the fact that we're very lucky here in London to have really the first models ever to be created of these prehistoric animals and put on display. And I will remind you to go to the Friends of the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs because they are the organisation here trying to help restore these. They are on the endangered list, not just animals, but on the heritage endangered list. They're in trouble. And so it's important that the charities are able to have funding to be able to preserve them. Uh, the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs soon will be building a special bridge over to the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs um, and that will allow people to have special tours over there and to get up and close to them and hopefully will uh, well, show to people that these exist here in South London. So this has been my paleo stroll and uh, it's been, a, you know, it's been a, a great time having you today. So I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, thanks for joining me, those who have. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next broadcast. Thank you. How was that? Not bad. Not bad. Got lots of good um, footage, I think. <laughs>